invite you to grab your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 will be in verse 26 and 27. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. These new clothes that you and I put on whenever we put on Christ includes self-control, although we don't always wear it appropriately. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26 reads, Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And don't give the devil an opportunity. Now there are three imperatives here, three commands here, and they're all connected together to this idea of anger. The first thing that he tells us is this, keep your anger under control. Keep your anger under control. It says, be angry and do not sin. It does not say, do not be angry. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, don't get angry. There there are places in the Bible where uh, anger is justified. I think of one when Jesus is in the temple and he notices that instead of being a house of prayer, it was a den of thieves, right? Instead of being a house of prayer, it was a, a group of folks trying to make money. And Jesus went in and he was angry about that, a righteous anger. Do you remember King David getting angry about Goliath cussing God? A righteous anger. There were some places where anger is appropriate, but what we see here is not a prohibition. Do not be angry. What we see is be angry and do not sin. We can't really control if we get angry. That's an emotional response to a situation. You have a couple of words for anger. Uh, One word is the word thumos. It's that quick anger. It's the one that just jumps on us when we're not looking for it. All of a sudden, something happens. Somebody says something. Somebody does something, and it's just a quick boom, and then we're angry. But this one is the word orge, which is a deep-seated anger. It usually leads to an outward response. Uh, This type of anger is something that uh, is not necessarily a quick response, but it's something that may have, doesn't have to be, but it could build over time. A situation in which you're angry and it's not resolved and it continues and it festers. We see this word used for the parable of the king and the unforgiving debtor. You may remember that parable. The, the debtor came to the king and asked for forgiveness. The king gave him forgiveness and then that debtor went out and he found another person that was indebted to him and beat him and threw him into prison. And the Bible says that the king was angry at that young at that debtor that was the story here another example is when the king sent out invitations to all the people to come to the wedding feast and they refused to come and made up all these excuses why they couldn't come to the wedding it says the king was angry and then in the story of the prodigal son it wasn't the father that was angry when the prodigal son came back who was it that was angry when the prodigal son came back it was the brother The brother was angry, and this word was used here. All of them had this deep-seated anger. It wasn't the quick response, but this deep-seated anger. Again, we see this word used in Matthew 5, 22. It says, But I tell you, everyone who is angry, that's this word, with his brother or sister, will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court, and whoever says you fool will be subject to hellfire. Now, this does seem like it's a prohibition to getting angry, but here in this verse, he is not talking about the emotion. He is talking about the action that is connected to the emotion. We need to separate the two. Because when he says be angry, he's emphasizing the emotional response. But when he says do not sin, he is emphasizing our reaction to that emotional response. How do we know that someone is angry? How do we know that? We can't see the emotion in their heart. All we can see is the outward response that they give. Some people are angry on the inside, and you never can see it on the outside. Some are angry on the outside, and you know what is in their heart. You can just tell. You see the steam coming out of their ears, right? You know what's happening on the inside. And he says here, do not sin. Because what he is saying is, when our anger is unresolved and unrestrained, it will always lead 
to sin. Now, what type of sin does it lead to? Well, uh, sometimes it leads to hatred. I'm so angry at that person, there's hatred there. Sometimes it leads to revenge. Sometimes it leads to physical attack. Sometimes to verbal attack, cut downs and slander and gossip. Sometimes to emotional attack, withdrawal, pouting, self-pity, self-deprecation. Uh, all of these things are our response to anger. We're trying to get back at the person or at the situation that made us angry. That is when we get into trouble when it comes to anger. If you do not control your anger, it will control you. I'll tell you a story. The last time that I received a spanking from my father, we were sitting around the dinner table one evening, and we had the most wonderful culinary experience that a person can have. We were having breakfast for dinner. Can I get a witness on breakfast for dinner? Amen. And so there was great excitement. There were the scrambled eggs. There was the bacon. There were some, my mom a lot of times did uh, hot cakes. Y'all got hot cakes down here? Pancakes? Y'all know what those are, right? And, and at our house, because we love Jesus, we put peanut butter on there and then syrup on top. Did anybody else do peanut butter and syrup? Look, if you hadn't done peanut butter and syrup on your pancake, you ain't lived yet, all right? I'm just saying. And so, oh, we had all of that there. We had, but did I mention the bacon? We had bacon there. I mean, it was great. You got all the stuff. Now, at our house, I've got two siblings. I've got a brother two years younger than me. I have a sister six years younger than me. And our rule was, before you could get seconds, you had to finish your firsts. Anybody else have that rule at their house? That's what we had at our house. So what that meant was, in order to get to seconds... You had to eat your firsts really fast, all right? And so, I mean, it's just, brrr. well, if you ever got to thirds, something wonderful had happened to you. And so I was working on my seconds. My brother was working on his seconds. And my little sister said, I'm finished. Would y'all like my eggs? Well, I was quicker on the draw. I said, I'll take them. And I got some thirds, and I took that plate of eggs, and I set it next to my plate of seconds. And as I was finishing my seconds, my brother reached over with his hand, grabbed my scrambled eggs, and stuffed them in his mouth. Everything went red for a moment. The next thing I knew... I was on top of my brother, fists drawn. He had scrambled eggs all over his face, all over his chest, and something stopped me in mid-punch. I started thinking through the room. I hear my mom hollering and crying back behind me. That didn't stop me. I began to look around, and I looked up, and I saw what it was that stopped me in mid-punch, I looked across the room, and I saw fire coming out of some eyes. I saw smoke coming out of nostrils, and it was my dad. And I said, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. And he hauled me off, and he gave me a whooping. I was in the 10th grade when that happened. Now, how silly is that to get in a fight over scrambled eggs? But what we don't know is that wasn't about scrambled eggs. That was about all of the animosity and all of the anger and all of the stuff that was built up over time dealing with a knuckle-headed younger brother. Now, I know that that is just a silly example. But there are many, many more real-life examples of how that deep-seated, unresolved, undealt-with anger has led to greater 
events? How many divorces? How much abuse? How many altercations could have been avoided if people would have just had their anger under control? Because you see, my friend, if we don't resolve the anger that's in our heart, that anger will end up controlling us and it will take us to a place that we would never, ever go under other normal circumstances. I'm now telling that story and I'm ashamed of that behavior because that was foolish. That was not wise. That was something that's against who I am as a person. And I've found that when I sin in my anger, I look back and I say, why did I do that? And the reason was I was unable to keep it under control. So how do we control this anger? He gives us two more, exam two more commands on how to deal with anger properly. Number one, he says, resolve your anger quickly. Resolve your anger quickly. It says in verse 26, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Literally, he is talking about the end of the day. He is talking about the sun going down and you going to bed and the day being over. But figuratively, what he's saying is, deal with it right now. Deal with it now while it is still today. If we don't deal with it now, we allow that to fester. We allow it to grow. This last few days, we had some guests at our home. One of them was, uh, my, was my brother and sister-in-law. It's my wife's older brother. He graduated the same year that I did. Kim is a year behind us in school. And we were dating in high school, and he was at home there while Kim and I were dating. Now, Michael, that's his name, Michael uh, had a mischievous bent in his life. And so what he would do is he would go into the refrigerator, and if and when he discovered that milk had soured, Instead of pouring it out and throwing it away, he would put the lid back on it, would shake it up really good, and put it back in the refrigerator. So one day, a hot summer day, old James had been out doing who knows what, and he came over to Kim's house and for a little visit and needed something to drink. Walked in, opened up the refrigerator, pulled out the milk. There was just a little bitty bit at the bottom. And, you know, you don't want to dirty up a glass when it's that way, do you? <laughs> so I popped the top, threw it back, started chugging. And you can't really tell it after that, like, first or second little chug. Then you realize what has gone in me is about to come out of me. Amen? And out it came. For so many of us, we have anger in our life and we go to bed and we think it's taken care of. But the next day, we pop the top on that and there it is all over again. We get anger in our life and, and we think that we put it aside. We, we think that it's, oh, we, I'm just going to not worry about that. Or, or, and we, and we, just, we put it away. But you know what? If it's not resolved, guess what? It is still there and it is still as nasty as it ever was. And it will still have control over your life each time it comes back. If you don't deal with it, it will just stay there and continue to be rotten in your life. Let me give you a few passages of Scripture with some wisdom on dealing with anger. Are you ready for this? Y'all don't look like you're ready for it. You got your pen and paper out? Write these down. I'm going to read them real quick, okay? I'm going to give you seven things. Are you ready? Number one, practice avoidance. Proverbs 22, 24 through 25. Don't make friends with an angry person, and don't be a companion of a hot-tempered one. Or you will learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Just stay away from anger, folks. Stay away from the issue. Stay, don't, don't get angry in the first place. The problem is, my cause of anger, I am responsible for feeding at my house. And so I can't get away from them. And so what do you do if you can't get away? Well, number two, practice restraint. Proverbs 14, 29. A patient person shows great understanding, but a quick-tempered one promotes foolishness. Proverbs 15, 18. 
A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but one slow to anger calms strife. I would say number three, practice surrender. Romans 12, 17. Do not repay anyone for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. Give it to Jesus. Whatever that, those scrambled eggs are in your life, whatever that spoiled milk is in your life, we want to hold on to it. We want to be in control of it, but surrender it to Jesus. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Number next, practice confession. 1 John 1, 9 if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Be quick to confess that sin. Practice prayer. And I would say practice prayer. Practice service to that person. Romans 12, 20 through 21. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. I would say seek a way to serve. If it's a person that's making angry, seek a way to serve that person. Pray for that person. It's amazing that when you pray for someone, your attitude toward that person changes. So spend time serving that person, praying for that person. Number six, practice reconciliation. Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell all of your friends in public about it. When we do that, all we do is we just fan the flame. But instead, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Go to them individually and talk it out. Communicate. Then last, practice forgiveness. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. When you come across this anger, this situation that is just building and growing and growing, you need to forgive the person that did you wrong. Reconcile to that individual. Spend time in prayer and in service to them. Uh, when you sin, go ahead and confess that sin quickly. Surrender that situation over to Jesus Christ. Practice restraint. Practice avoidance. My friends, when you tackle it that way, the bottom line is... You're surrendering it to Jesus and you are dealing with anger God's way instead of dealing with it your way. Because as long as you deal with it your way, it will still be there. And if you don't control anger, it will control you. Number three, protect your anger from Satan. Protect your anger. From Satan. Look at what it says. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Now it may seem that this is not connected to this issue of anger, but it is. Grammatically, it's part of that same sentence that began in verse 26. Don't give the devil an opportunity. What does the devil want to do? Well, John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy his desire is to destroy you first peter 5 8 says be so reminded be alert your adversary the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone he can devour satan's goal in life is to eat you and to destroy you and to devour you and how does he do that he does that by getting a toehold in your life by getting a foothold in your life, 
by finding an area of your life that is not submitted to Jesus Christ, an area that is not repented of, an area that is unresolved, and he gets into that and he begins to just feed that and feed that and feed that and feed that until it is a raging fire that cannot be contained. I went to lunch with a senior adult man a while back, and as we were visiting over lunch, he began to tell me some stories about his employer, about his brothers, his family, just some stories from life. As he was telling these stories, he became more and more agitated. He became more and more animated. Uh, you could sense in his demeanor, you could sense in his tone and in his voice a deep-seated anger that led to bitterness, led to hatred. He continued to talk about this, and eventually I said, Well, sir, when did all this happen? He said, Oh, about 30 years ago. His life was one of bitterness and of misery because his whole life revolved around the idol of anger. It starts as this little toehold. And then you sin in your anger. And all sin feels good, amen? There's a reason we do it. It feeds our pride. It feeds our arrogance. We get angry and we dream about revenge and we look forward to revenge and we look forward to getting them back and to proving them wrong. And so it just festered and festered and festered till over three decades later it consumed his life and everything he ever looked at was bitter because the anger had controlled you know, this man once said, driving down the road looking at a West Texas sunset, I don't like them. You don't like them? What don't you like? I don't like sunsets. Who doesn't like sunset? Someone whose heart has become embittered by not dealing with anger. How many people have I come across who said, oh, I don't want to go to church because they were mean to me one time. They said something crossways to me one time. Someone down at the church did something to me. My parents claimed to be Christians, yet my dad left, my mom left, they got divorced. How many lives have been derailed because they trusted a pastor and in their moral, pastor's moral failings, it brought anger and bitterness and resentment toward the individual. And now, when God speaks, they don't listen. All they hear is the raging anger within them. There's no softness towards the Lord. It's all bitterness will you come to Christ I'm angry will you come to Sunday school I'm angry will you come to church I'm angry and because of that anger and because of that bitterness the devil keeps people in bondage but when you give your life to Jesus. I said, when you give your life to Jesus, He'll free you from that bitterness and that anger and that pain. You take off the old clothes. You now have experienced the forgiveness from heaven, and you are able to share it with others. Oh, but that old flesh 
is so attractive. That old sin is so attractive. And we want to put those clothes back on. And we want to take control of our anger. We want to take control of our pride. We want to get them back. But my friends, for someone who has been redeemed by the blood of Christ, there is no room for unresolved, uncontrolled anger. And if you allow that in your life, you will not be able to grow in the Lord. You will not be able to be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. You will not be able to honor the Lord because you have held on to anger. How do you stop the raging forest fire? The way to stop the raging forest fire is to never let it get out of control to begin with. Some of you in this room, you identify exactly with my friend. You've had a deep, long-term anger and resentment towards someone. Don't you think it's time to let go of that? Don't you think it's time to trust Jesus with that? Don't you think it's time to get out from underneath the burden of your anger and live in the glory of God's joy? I challenge you and encourage you if you know Jesus Christ today, give that anger to Him. Confess your sin and surrender it to Jesus and ask Jesus to take care of it and ask Him to let you forget it. But if you've never come to Christ today, maybe it's that anger, that bitterness, that history that's keeping you from Jesus. I would encourage you, don't let Satan send you to hell over something like your anger. Give that to Jesus as well. If you live in the Lafayette, Louisiana area and are not currently active in a church, we'd love for you to visit us. You can find directions, service times, and what to expect on our website at fbclaf.org.